Central Thinker Television, brought to you by Sportsman's Warehouse, America's premier outfitter. Coldwell Banker, every day until it's sold. St. Croix Rod, the best rods on earth. Evan Rude, spend more time on the water. Good morning. Welcome to Fishful Thinker. I'm Chad Lachance. Familiar face joining me, Mr. Nathan Zielinski, joining us yeah. this morning on the show. If you're a fan of Fishful Thinker, you've seen this gentleman on the show before. We've done some ice fishing. We trolled for pike. Yep. This one's going to be fun. We're out on Chatfield Reservoir, and we're fishing for Metro Walleyes. It's April, and uh, we've got some fish that are spawning, some fish that are done spawning. What do you expect out of the day? You know, we're hoping, again, getting all these post-spawn fish. These fish have been recuperating. It can be a tougher time of year, but we put a bait in front of them. They should take it. Well, there you go. Doing some jigging for walleyes, a very, very classic Western thing. This should be a fun show, so get comfortable and stay tuned. We'll see if we can show you some beautiful Metro Walleyes. Okay, so what the deal is here is that we're fishing on a metro impoundment, and as with a lot of western reservoirs, there was gravel quarries here in the river bottom. The South Platte River comes in right here, and there was gravel quarries here. And what we're fishing is the gravel quarries that are underneath this lake. They were submerged, now they're underneath this lake, and we're fishing those quarries. And the reason being, as Nate will talk to us, big drop-offs, shelves, drop-offs, the quarries themselves were deep, and that gives us the, the terrain, the structure that we need. Absolutely, you know, we got 30 feet of water on either side of this, it's almost just a ridge right between them. The whole reason they're here is, again, we're talking post-spawn fish. The fish are, they're not so much lazy, but they lost all their energy. They haven't eaten in, you know, a couple weeks, even to a month, so they don't have a lot of energy. They can't waste their energy chasing down food, so they sit on these high points. We have these shad in this deeper water swimming around. They hit that wall. They're not smart enough just to turn around and leave, so the shads hit it, and kind of swim over it. So we have these fish sitting on top, just waiting for the food to come to them. So we're just presenting these jigs right on that top, right where they're hungry, right where they're feeding. Right in their face. Right in their face. I love it. That's it. Nathan makes a full-time living guiding here and other places as well, and as well as doing some tournament fishing for walleyes. What do, you, what do you find is some of the consistencies for staying on top of western reservoir walleyes as opposed to eastern, say, a Minnesota natural lake type fish? You know, our, our fish hold the structure pretty good. We have a ton of bait. So the biggest thing is, is they're going to be where the food's at, almost like any lake. But uh, you know, out here we have a lot of structure. We don't have a lot of big basins. You know, everything's man-made, so a lot of structure. So we do find a lot of immature fish or male fish holding the structure, big females to spin, almost just you know, like some of the bigger waters. Gotcha. Now I know that water level fluctuation is key in, uh, in, in the west, anywhere in the western reservoirs we give a lot. The lake that I guide on fluctuates almost 70 vertical feet a year, which is unfathomable to a guy from Minnesota or Wisconsin. But that keeps fish moving as well. It keeps them wanting access to deep water a lot of the time. It, it does. You know, they say some of the best tournament fishermen in the country are from the west because they're dealing with changing conditions. Constantly. You know, so again, yeah, water levels change, temperatures change a lot. You know, you have big rivers flowing into lakes, you know, cold water and things like that really affect the temperature as well. Yeah. I mean, what, what looks more real or more natural than a, than a three inch, just a plain smelt colored minnow? It just, you know, it's not intimidating. It doesn't rattle. It doesn't. It doesn't have a lot of flashy color. It doesn't have any, just smells good and tastes good and therefore everybody eats it. Exactly. And as you know, confidence is one of the most important things in catching fish. It's 100%, I'd say, almost the most important part. Yep, and so everyone has their confidence things. When we fished with Nate up uh, at Spinney, Spinney Mountain Reservoir for Pike, you know, he, he said right off the bat, well, the, no point in changing lures, you gotta change spots because he's so confident in the baits that he was throwing up there that there's no point in, in changing. Now I'm jigging on six pound test, trialing 100% fluorocarbon and an eight ounce jig. So it's a relatively subtle deal. It's a six foot nine medium light St. Croix Legend Extreme Rod. It's extremely light rod. This rod weighs nothing at all. The six pound fluorocarbon and the titanium guys, a very sensitive package. Bows up real nice when you set the hook, too. So we have made contact with the first fish of the morning. A little gulp minnow strikes right off the bat, and we've been fishing. What'd you put us? It took us all about 15 minutes, maybe. 
And we're in a metro lake, like I said, right here at Chatfield. Beautiful walleye, just what, uh, what our fearless leader said we'd find here. And uh, look at that, that's a pretty one right there. Nice fish to get us started, Mr. Zelensky. Thanks very much, that's you know, beautiful. What you gotta say about the gulp real quick. Fish are finicky and we're jigging. And look where that jig is at. Gone, baby. That's, that's what you want to see right, right off the right bat. There. That's why they call it gulp right there, is you get that gulp. Let's set that St. Croix down and get him uh, get him taken care of. Beautiful fish. Now, one thing I got to say about Nate, you can see that's a gorgeous fish. Let me get my pliers. One thing I got to say about Nate. One time we filmed with Nate, Nate says, uh, says I want a big pike. 40 minutes later, we had a 40-inch pike. Then we wanted smallmouth through the ice and it took us about 10 minutes to get those. Now we're 15 minutes on a metro lake and got a beautiful walleye. Appreciate that, that's a good right. start to the morning. Let me take this fish right over here and we'll put him overboard. But that's a great eating size fish, get that fin up. What a beautiful walleye, I gotta love that. Put him right down here. See you buddy. <laughs> that's the way to get your morning started. We're within a stone's throw of a half million people right here in Denver and this fishery gets absolutely pounded but it's got a lot of bait in it, it's got a lot of water fluctuation, it has the South Platte River running in it and it grows big fat walleyes as Mr. Linsky told us we'd catch. So let's get another one. Beautiful. The use of soft plastics are absolutely key to almost all of our angling here at Fishful Thinker. But not all soft plastics are created equal, and we use a really distinct system when we're choosing which kind of soft plastic to use, and it's based on the shape of the bait. If I want to really swim a bait that's swimming very evenly in the water column that I'm casting and retrieving, I like a curl tail bait, like this little power grub. The curl tail will give an excellent swimming action as I retrieve that bait through the water. If I want a very gliding type presentation, here's a three inch power tube jig and it's hollow. I would put a tube inside and this bait will glide very nicely on slack line when I cast it out. This would be a little bit more of a subtle presentation, not quite as much continuous motion. If I want a crisp, more erratic action, then I'll have a straight tail bait like this little three inch power bait minnow. And the reason is with it being a little straight tail bait like this, the bait will be very erratic and darting in the water, depending on of course what action I put on it. But by choosing the shape of my plastic to match the presentation that I really want, I could put any one of those on the same jig head and achieve completely different results just by the shape of the body. So keep that in mind when you're choosing your soft plastic bait, that beyond the color and size, the shape of that bait and how it's going to behave in the water will make a big difference in catching fish. biggest things about being out with a guy that fishes all the time, like Nate's a guide, I do some guiding as well, is is, uh, is a lot of the details. And, and we were just talking a little bit about boat control. What's your theories on boat control? You know, what it is, especially this type of situation, we're throwing jigs up on these shallow spots, is to not spook your fish. So right now the boat here is in like 15, 20 feet of water. We got 10 feet of water, and we actually got like six, seven feet of water there. Now, six, seven feet, no issues. But all of a sudden you have a boat that's sitting in the water a foot or two, have a big motor, electric motor running, you can spook these fish in a hard Heartbeat. Sure. So we threw out a marker buoy and I use it for one as like a location marker, but two, I think of that as a wall. My boat does not want to cross that. So our fish are there. I know if I go over that one time with the motor, we're done fishing for a couple hours. And gotcha. that can be crucial. That's something people need to focus on because a lot of people run over their fish sure. and they wonder what's happening. Well, not especially on a metro lake like this, gets tons of boat traffic. These fish probably can tell you what brand of sonar you have when <laughs> exactly. you go over the top of them. So you got to be super careful of that. And you know, one of the other key things in, in a, lot of, uh, a lot of staying consistent and knowing when you can go catch them day in and day out is the use of your electronics. We talk about it on almost every episode of Fishful Thinker, but we build our patterns every day based on our conditions, but you use your electronics to locate your spots, to be able to get back to your spots, to evaluate your spots. The combination of sonar and GPS, absolutely invaluable. Uh, the Lawrence products in, in my boat and, and Nate's boat, gotta, absolutely got to have them. Absolutely. Got to have them. If you're going to be consistent, you got to have them. Now, if you're a fan of Fishful Thinker, you might remember Nate and I came out here and ice fished for smallmouth bass. And, uh, and same, same data as you, you see on his graph here, lots and lots of GPS waypoints. Put all that into the handheld unit. I've got a Lawrence Endura unit. He uses an H2O Lawrence unit, handheld. Put that data in the handheld and then come out here on ice and do exactly the same thing. It's a great system. 
Nate, what else might we catch doing this? You know, we got some smallmouth in the lake, got some trout. Um, that's about the most species that's cruising around right now. There is some carp cruising around. Some, some big, Rocky Mountain redfish. Big, big carp. <laughs> got about a 20 pounder last week. Nice. But uh, Carp are fish too, you know. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Now, besides jigging, what other patterns do you use on a regular basis to catch walleyes in, in, in the metro impoundments? Because you, you guide it just here at Cherry Creek here as well? Here in Cherry Creek, yep. Here in Cherry Creek. Now, Cherry Creek's another metro impoundment right here in Denver. But uh, what other key patterns do you use you know, over we, the course of do, the year? We do a lot of jigging. We also do some slip bobbering. It's okay. real effective. You know, you can pin up on a spot if you have them really stacked up on one little area. You know, anchor, you use your electric motor, hold yourself, throw slip barbers up there. Um, live bait rigs midsummer sometimes. You know, using actually live bait, dragging them on a, on a slip rig uh, mm -hmm. is real effective. And then we do a lot of trolling and casting with crankbaits. Uh -huh. um, it's the other big thing. That's how we produce a lot of our big fish at times. Um, even fishing at night, catching some big fish, you know, casting and trolling crankbaits. Gotcha. Now you reference a crankbait, you might call something like a rogue or a fire stick minnow a crankbait. Some guys might call it a stick bait. Yeah. Uh, I would call it a jerk bait, but bottom line is they're longer, skinnier profile baits. And the whole deal with working a jig is no different than working any other bait. The details of how you're working that bait are what you need to be observing so that if you get bit, you know how to duplicate it. That's how you build your pattern. It's more than just a matter of where you're catching or what the bait is, but literally it's how deep are they biting the bait, how fast are you moving the bait, are you, are you hopping it, are you dragging it? Are you swimming it? What are you doing with the jig? Way up, way down, top of the jig, everything. Yeah, all the little details all come together to form your pattern. And by being observant, that's how you can duplicate it. All right, and I bit it right on the pop. I popped this bait up out of the weeds, and that drag's a little loose. I popped it up out of the weeds pretty aggressively, and the bait rolled over at the top, so I was a little late on the hook set because I really didn't feel it. The bait just didn't sink back down. I snapped it up and it didn't sink back to the bottom. And if it doesn't go back to the bottom, given that there's lead strapped on the end of it, whoa, that wasn't a very good job of mine controlling the fish. Mr. Zelensky, thanks very much. Let me get a hold of him, we'll get him out of the net here and we'll show you what we got. I think it's time for me to switch baits. Woo, the gulp comes through again and truthfully, the bite's been a little bit tough for the last hour. Sun got, came out and it got real warm. There's that minnow, you can see it. And that's a beautiful fish right in the metro impoundment. Absolutely gorgeous fish. Thanks, sir. Yeah, the gulp comes through, little gulp minnow. Everybody eats that thing. You look at the fangs on these. Anyone that doesn't think of a walleye as a predator clearly hasn't looked down their mouth. So that one, the, 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 I popped the bait out of the weeds. It rolls over right at the top. Boom, fish popped it right at the top. Bait just didn't sink. So that was the whole deal. Let's get him put back over here. Beautiful, look at the nice colors in the sun. I like their big kind of lizard head on them. See you, buddy. <laughs> there you go. Got to pay attention. When I pop that bait and it rolls to the top and doesn't sink to the bottom, something's wrong. Somebody grabbed it, and that's exactly what happened. There was no feel to the bite. The bait just didn't go back to the bottom. I came tight, and there was a fish on it stuck him. So it worked pretty good. I like that. One of the things, it doesn't matter if you're jigging or any other presentation, paying attention to the details of how you're working that lure or fly or whatever it is, is really, really important. You could literally be dragging this bait on the bottom. You could be hopping it along the bottom, which is what, what we've been kind of doing. Nate's been doing a lift and then holds the line tight and let the bait pendulum back towards him. Uh, you could be doing a real aggressive, what I call a snap jig, which is what just got me bit, where I popped the bait up off the bottom real hard and let it just roll over at the top. But paying attention to those details and trying to duplicate them rather than just fishing your jig the same every time will definitely catch you more fish. So that on the same hump, still doing the same thing. We definitely have a pattern worked out here. And uh, this might not be a walleye actually, now that I say I have a pattern. Oh no, it's a bass, look at that. Big fat smallmouth. Leave it to the bass fishermen in the group to find a big smile. Just as I'm saying, I'm getting a pattern worked out. I catch the wrong species, and so it's not it really a pattern. Totally ruins my spot. Yeah, well, well, that's okay. Because the bass fisherman in me isn't really that discriminant as to what I catch. As much as I'd love to tell you I had another big walleye, look at my gulp minnow is perfect, right in the top of the snout. There's the damage right there. Beautiful smallmouth. 
Now we came out with Nate and we ice fished and we caught a bunch of these through the ice. Nice, pretty colors on them. Nice fish. fish. You probably won't shake my hand with bass exactly. line. Exactly. Ruins it. But, uh, but absolutely gorgeous. And yes, we're fishing for walleyes, but I have long said, and I'm going to say it again, I'm going to bring this over here and let him go. We'll put him over the side of the boat here. Look at that. That's a nice looking smallmouth right there. Now, let's see. Watch this. Watch straight down. <laughs> The deal about jigging is jigging catches all kinds of fish, bass, walleyes, whatever. When you're fishing a three inch gold minnow like that, you are in the hunt. Big fish eat little fish. I always say that. We're on a spot that we know is holding walleyes. Apparently it's holding smallies and no one told him he wasn't a walleye. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff right there. Good stuff. Now, the only, a couple other things to keep in mind is the, it's real slick. So I've been snapping the jig pretty aggressive so the jig will hop and roll and we keep talking about it but it's kind of a, a hybrid between a jigging bite and a true reaction bite. I could, oh, hey, well, wait a minute. Now Nathan's got one here. Let me get my stuff out of the way. Mine is the correct species. Yeah, you think? <laughs> yeah, see, the correct yeah. species. Here at Fishful Thinker, we don't discriminate. We like all the fish. And he did, in fact, get the correct species. Which side are you coming around? Now you got him over here? Okay. That's a, oh, nice. And we got him. Well done, Mr. Zelensky. Let's, uh, what you got there? Oh, look, he's still dribbling. Nice. Here we are. Now, I mean, it's literally been, what, 15 seconds since we yep. caught a smallmouth on the exact same spot. So I'm guessing there's shad moving around in here, and it's really not even a guess because we've marked them on the Lowrance. We Fish know they're getting shad. active, exactly. The shad start moving around, they come up here, and everything comes after it. Nice. Sun comes out in the spring, and the, the water temperature comes up a little bit. Everyone gets happy, exactly. including me. We need to get back fishing, catch <laughs> a couple more of them. It's a beautiful fish. Well done. Well done, Mr. Zelensky. Send him on his way. Now, I just caught a nice small mouth, and we've been doing a bunch of jigging and ripping this jig through weeds. I'm a huge proponent of fresh knots at all times. Fresh knots. you got to have good, clean knots. So that small mouth wasn't giant, and this is a six-pound test. But it was enough to put some tension on that knot, and just ripping the bait through the weeds is harder than knots. So if nothing else, more fish are lost by bad knots. I keep fresh knots. You agree with that, Nate? Absolutely. You know, it, it takes three. Sorry, that was a weed. I got caught up. Um, <laughs> It takes two seconds to retie, but to lose a fish of a lifetime takes a half second. Mm, so good point. You know, take the time, retie, definitely. Yep. It's worth it. You know, yeah. It's easy not to do, but you sure regret it when you lose when, that fish yeah, of a lifetime. And, and there's nothing like that feeling. <laughs> One thing that's funny is we're right here in town, and we've had pelicans, ospreys, seagulls. Must be some fish in this pond of yours. Exactly. Now, you know, Chad, it's funny, when we, we caught those two fish, we really didn't think about it, but we were catching your first couple fish on this spot here, came on that far side. We fished it for a little while longer, didn't get nothing. The second we changed up that angle, yep. we caught the fish again. Yep, two of them, quick, too. You know, you've really got to consider thinking about that. You have these shallow spots like this, and, you know, this is our structure. And a lot of people approach this from one side, and if they don't catch fish, they call it good. You know, when you have a shallow like this, deep on both sides, a lot of times, you know, your bait fish might be approaching from one side or your other fish. You know, yeah. we don't exactly, from up here, get to see right. exactly how everything's happening. So a lot of times, you have to present that bait in the same fashion that, say, the shad are coming from or your forage base, and that can make all the difference in the world. So really, spot on spot selection, pick your structure apart and try to get the best odds there. Yeah, I, I agree with that, uh, absolutely. When we were preparing to come down here, uh, Nate and I talked a little bit about the fact that we would be jigging. That's all we talked about. He says, well, I said, Nate, what do I need to bring? Well, bring your jigs. Okay. So I show up with my confidence jigs, and he's fishing his confidence jigs. They're not the same, but they're both working. But one thing that did happen that was the same, and I think is probably as important, and Nate just brought up, and I agree with him, very thin line. Yep. What do you got? I'm running six-pound XT. Six-pound trilene XT. I've got six-pound trilene 100% fluorocarbon. The key is not the, the brand or the material. It's the fact that it's six-pound. By using very thin line, especially on pressured fish like this, it allows your jig to be more natural in the water. It allows it to behave more naturally, uh, less influence of the rod on the jig. Exactly. You know, that thicker line will hang up. It just doesn't cut through the water, so your jig falls and it might turn. You know, head first and kind of fall funny. As it's real thin like this, it just slices through the water and it falls real naturally. Pulls it and, right that, down. and that's huge. Yeah, Absolutely I think huge. especially on a fishery that gets fished a lot. And you know there's a lot of people that jig here. And I'd be willing to bet that the vast majority of them are 8, 10, 12 pound tests. Exactly. 
And yeah, you have some risk of losing some fish, but with good smooth reels, looks like we're both running Abu reels, good, yep. good smooth reels, good smooth drag set to protect your line. <laughs> your drag should have nothing to do with the fish you're catching, only the line you have rigged on. It should be just tight enough to protect your line and no tighter. And, uh, and we almost never break off fish. No, I mean, it, it's rare. If, you, if you're breaking off a fish, you had a nick on your line. Yeah. I mean, it is hard to, I mean, six pound is tough to break. I tougher mean, it, than people realize. Tough. Tough for the people, good fresh knots and good fresh line. Exactly. Key key elements to success. But yeah, that thinner. Don't be fooled by it. It definitely can it can up your odds. Yep. Presentation's key. Gotta get bit before you can break them off. Yeah. Well, anyone looking through that camera right there can see that our day is coming to a short end, Mr. Zelensky. <laughs> I think we're gonna get wet, and we're really not into getting wet. We've had a pretty good morning in the boat. Yeah, What'd caught some say? fish. Caught some fish, caught a few species, almost even caught a trout, but we have had a good time. We came to catch walleyes, we caught some walleyes, caught a bonus bass as well. I think it's a bonus, Nate might see it a different way, but, <laughs> but we caught a bonus bass as well. Jigging, metro impoundment, great way to catch fish in the late spring as the walleyes are done spawning. Yeah, you yeah think? these jigs are gonna carry us through the next couple months, so I mean, it's a great technique. There you go, great stuff. Real quick, they wanna get a hold of you at tightlineoutdoors.com? Yeah, tightlineoutdoors.com, it's the best way. Nate. As always, thanks for being a guest on Fishful Thinker sure. Television. Thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you learned something to get you out and get you fishing, get your jigs, get after it, watch the details, and we'll catch more fish. Thanks, we'll see you next week. Whoa, <laughs> Sorry, dude. It's funny because the buoy was way off to the side of it. Like my line looked like my jig must be swirling around more than once. No need to even talk. <laughs> you catch the, the buoy line. <laughs> Because I made the comment that you were going to catch a controlling. Look, I'm not even snagged on it, just slides freely up and down. Yeah. What have we heard all morning? Then he catches the buoy. Oh, dude. There he is, he's on it. Got him. Oh!